I'm Susan Edmonds. I'm a weaver and a former classics student. I'm talking with two classic scholars, Prudence Jones of Rutgers University and Gregory Nagy of Harvard University in the Center for Hellenic Studies. We're talking about how cloth was made in ancient Greece and Rome, and why understanding techniques of cloth production can make us better readers of Greek and Latin. Prudence, why do you think a classicist should know about textile techniques? First of all, knowing how cloth was made in antiquity helps with understanding what daily life was like, especially for women. Women would have learned to spin as young girls, and would have carried their spinning with them almost constantly for the rest of their lives. And when not spinning, they most likely would be weaving. A painting on a Greek face of the 6th century BCE shows women weighing packets of fleece, drawing out the fleece to prepare it for spinning, spinning it into thread, weaving the thread into cloth, and folding the finished cloth. In modern times, when we put words together in writing on a page, it's the text. The word text, English word text, comes from Latin textus, but Latin textus doesn't mean text. It means fabric. It means weaving and the product of weaving. And it comes from the verb texere, which means to weave. In other words, in ancient times, putting words together is visualized primarily by way of thinking of weaving. And that means that textus, text, is not just text, it's textile. Textile production was also a contribution women made to the economy. We learn from the Greek historian Xenophon that textile work was the most important ability to look for in a wife. By the time of the Roman Empire, there were more opportunities to purchase ready-made clothing but textile work remained one of the most important symbols of female virtue. In fact, an epitaph for a Roman woman from the first century BCE eulogizes her diligence in woolworking along with her piety, thrift, and faithfulness. Even the subversive women in Aristophanes' Lysistrata demonstrate how important textile work was to ancient thought. In this play, the women of the Greek city-states use a sex strike to compel their men to make peace. At one point, Lysistrata, the head conspirator, compares political reform to cleaning a fleece and preparing it for spinning. As with a fleece, says Lysistrata, you first have to wash the dung from the city-state in a bath. Then, putting it on a couch, you have to beat out the rascals with a rod, pick out the burrs, and tear out the ones who stick together and felt themselves to each other for power, and pluck off their heads. Then you have to tease it out into a little basket of common goodwill, mixing in everyone, the resident aliens, and if any other foreigner is dear to you, and if someone helped the state, mix them in as well. And by Zeus, you must think of the cities, however many are colonies of this land, to think that they lie for you like locks of wool, each one separately. And then, taking a tuft from all these, bring them together, and gather them into one, and then make a great ball of wool for spinning. And then from this, you can weave a cloak for the community. The hands that you have just seen are those of my friend Nelda Davis, a master spinner. It seems as if Lysistrata and her companions were using wool. Yes, fibers used for textile production in antiquity included flax, from which linen is made, other plant fibers, and even silk. But wool was by far the most common in Greece and Rome and woolworking provided the imagery in Greek and Latin literary sources, so we'll concentrate on that. These Shetland sheep are small and hardy, and probably similar to those of antiquity. They give fleeces of various colors. The sheep are shorn, typically, once a year. This shearer uses blades rather than modern clippers. These are 19th century blades, but they're actually very similar to those used in antiquity. This variegated fleece is dark at the tips of the locks, but the fluffier inner part is white. It is spread out and any obvious dirt, especially around the edges, is pulled off. Beating the fleece with a stick loosens it, fluffs it out, and helps to it to release the dirt that is folded into it. It's picky work, pulling off the bits of dung and straw. Washing, though not very effective at removing straw and twigs, can remove an astonishing amount of dirt consisting of accumulated mud, sweat, and natural oils. Here's a lock of washed fleece. 
Would dyeing be done at this stage? Yes, the fleece would be dyed while it's still wet from washing. The fleece would be immersed in a pot of dye prepared from plants or shellfish or, um, or even insects, and it would be simmered for a matter of hours or even days. After that, it would be washed again. Here's some dyed fleece. What I'm wondering is how would a little lock like this turn into a long thread? Good question. It partly depends on the fact that wool fibers are covered with scales. Here's a picture of a wool fiber under a microscope. The scales make the fibers cling to each other a bit. When one is pulled away, others are pulled along with it. Let us imagine how spinning might have evolved from working with the hands alone to the real efficiency of the spindle. The spinner loosens the fibers and begins to draw a few of them away from the rest. With her fingers, she twists the fibers forming the beginning of a thread. She twists a little, draws out a few more fibers, and twists some more. With her left hand, she controls the rest of the lock, allowing some, but not all of the fibers, to catch into the twist. By controlling the amount of twist and how far she draws the fibers out, she can control the thickness of the thread. Now she has a length of thread about as long as she can comfortably hold her two hands apart. The problem is that if she lets go of either end, the fibers untwist and the thread falls apart. A simple tool like this forked stick will help. The spinner catches a bit of fiber with the forked stick. She can turn the stick more easily than twisting the fibers in her fingers and quickly produces a length of thread. The stick has the further advantage that the spun thread can be wound around it and thus will not untwist. The thread is wound on the stick and the spinning begins again, twisting and drawing out. This variegated fleece, which contains both black and white fibers, allows the twist in the thread to be seen clearly. With nothing more than a forked stick, a fine, even thread can be spun. The forked stick is not the perfect solution, however. Notice how hard the spinner's right hand must work to provide enough twist. Moving up the ladder of technological evolution, we come to the spindle. But before the spindle can be used effectively, the fleece must be transformed from tight locks to a loose, rope-like, homogeneous mass called a roving. One way to make a roving is simply to pull apart the locks, recombine them and pull them apart again, always drawing them out into a long mass. The locks are thus separated and the fibers aligned with each other. The process might also be started by using some kind of comb, like this one from Central Asia. The comb is held between the knees. The locks of fleece are placed over the tines. Then the fleece is drawn off, separating and aligning the fibers. The process is repeated several times. The process of separating and aligning fibers, that would be expressed in ancient Greek by xino. Right. Yes, the usual translation carding means something a little different to a wool worker today. But the main thing is that the fibers go from being organized in locks to being a loose homogeneous mass. Carding comes up in Plato's dialogue The Statesman in which statecraft is likened to weaving. Before construction of a cloak or state can begin, there must be a process of division for which carding provides the perfect analogy. The carded fleece is drawn out over and over again. In the vase painting, while each of the other activities occurs only once, drawing out the roving is shown three times. It had to be done over and over to make a roving from which a fine, even thread could be spun. Techniques of hand spinning vary somewhat from culture to culture. In Greek and Roman antiquity, spinners used a spindle with a spindle whorl attached at its lower end. This one is a nicely shaped stick with a carved notch to hold the thread in place. The spindle whorl functions as a flywheel to keep the spindle turning once it's set in motion. Spindle whorls like these are common finds in archaeological sites, but you know, if you want to make your own spindle, you can do it using a pen and a CD. Good point. In fact, all of these processes involve simple tools and rather ingenious methods. For example, the distaff. It's basically a stick to hold enough fiber to allow the spinner to spin a long, continuous thread without interruption. After a couple of firm wraps around the distaff, the roving is wound into a loose mass. A previously spun thread, 
The leader is wrapped tightly around the spindle, and the spindle whorl is pushed on. Then the leader is passed along the notch at the end of the spindle and laid over the end of the roving, which is tapered out. As the spindle is turned, the leader twists and catches some of the fibers at the end of the roving. The twist runs up into the mass of fibers, and the thread begins to form. The spinner's right hand alternatively gives the spindle a spin, and then draws out the fibers and smooths them as they form a thread. The spinner's left hand, holding the distaff, controls the twist coming into the fibers, and thus the evenness of the thread. When the thread gets so long that the spindle touches the ground, it is wound up on the spindle, and the process continues. The spun thread accumulates on the spindle. Here again is a spinner's eye view. That reminds me of the three women who spin the fates of Peleus and Thetis at their wedding in Catullus, poem 64. Her left hand was holding the distaff, cloaked in soft wool. Then, gently drawing out the thread, her right hand was shaping it with upturned fingers. Then she was turning the spindle, weighted with a round weight, twisting it on her thumb, which was inclined forward, and thus her plucking tooth was always evening out the work. Greg, are there other metaphors drawn from spinning? Well, my favorite is embodied in the word duco. This is, some, this is a verb that everybody learns in first year of Latin, and people define it as lead. But a more basic meaning for duco is maintain the continuity. And one of the most natural and basic ways of visualizing maintenance of continuity is spinning the thread. And in fact, duco and its derivative de duco are consistently used with direct objects having to do with the thread of thought, but including the thread of the thought of the poem. And I think of two illustrations in Latin poetry, one of them comes from Horace's Epistles 2-1, where the poet says that the poet's task is to de ducere, that is to say, to maintain the continuum uh, of the poem. And the direct object of de ducere in this context is a poema. Then I think of another example, uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses, um, third line of the first scroll, where the poet invokes the muses by asking them to de ducere, that is to say, to spin from the top down the continuity of their song. You could take your spindle with you and produce thread pretty much continuously while doing other things. Herodotus tells us how an early instance of multitasking helps convince the Persian king Darius that the Peonians would make good allies. Equipping their sister as best they could, they sent her for water, carrying a vessel on her head, and leading a horse with her arm, and spinning flax. As the woman passed, she caught the eye of Darius, for the deeds of the woman were neither Persian, nor Lydian, nor done by any one of Asia. And he asked if all the women there were so diligent, and they said enthusiastically that it was so. Such diligence in spinning was a matter of necessity. It took seven to ten spinners to keep one weaver busy. Let's take a look now at the basic physics of weaving, apart from any cultural context. First, there's a set of parallel threads, the warp. The warp is held under tension. And another thread, the weft, sometimes called the woof, travels through it. In the simplest weaving, a single weft thread travels across the warp, going over one thread, under the next, over the next, so forth, till it comes to the end and goes back in the other direction, going over each one it previously went under, and vice versa. You can really see how the interlacing of warp and weft is the perfect analogy for what we call the fabric of society. Bringing the weft thread over, under, over, under is slow work. 
We can reduce the amount of work dramatically with just a simple stick, the shed rod, inserted under every second warp thread. By raising the stick, we create a space called a shed through which the weft can pass going in one direction. With just this simple innovation, the shed rod, we can speed up the work dramatically. A passage can be made for the weft going back in the other direction with some loops of string called heddles, which go under each warp that the shed rod went over and loop around the heddle rod. When the heddle rod is lifted, a second shed is created. But when the heddle rod is not lifted, the length of the strings allows the shed rod to create its shed. Automating a loom with a shed rod and a heddle rod greatly speeds the work. Here is the shed rod, and here is the heddle rod in this ancient loom. This type of loom is called a warp-weighted loom because the warps are held under tension by clay or stone weights attached at their ends. The warp-weighted loom originated in the Neolithic period and was used throughout Europe in classical antiquity. It was still used in remote parts of Scandinavia, even in the 20th century. Although other types of looms were common in Rome by the time of the empire, the warp-weighted loom was still used for ceremonial purposes, like wedding garments. Here's another example of a loom, 5th century BCE painting. We see Penelope in the foreground and the loom in the background. Penelope is, of course, one of the most famous examples of an ancient weaver. In Book 19 of Homer's Odyssey, Penelope promises her suitors that she will marry one of them once she has finished weaving a funeral cloth for her father-in-law Laertes. Every day she weaves, and every night she secretly unweaves, thus postponing the unwanted marriage. Well, it's almost as if Penelope is using deceit by way of working the wool. This is a great example of how wool working, even though it's a symbol of female virtue, could be seen as subversive since it is an activity that women would do apart from the company of men. What is the point of Penelope's story? It is um, the telos for a story that would be the ending. Uh, for uh, the task that she has, it is uh, getting to the end of making the fabric, except that she keeps unmaking it. And the word for unmaking it here, um, analuo, which gives us the English word analysis, uh, is an undoing both uh, in, on the level of fabric work and on the level of um, storytelling. There are back and forth patterns in Penelope's story where she does something and then undoes something. Makes us think all the more of the goal directedness of the story. And uh, if we think of it in terms of weaving, well, there's the word uh, oime, which would mean web, but I think of the way you have to have just the right kind of web by having just the right kind of beginning. And uh, to have the right kind of beginning, the right start would be a pro-oimion, in other words, the front of an, an oime, the front of a web. Making the right start for a warp-weighted loom involved making a heading band. The heading band is a way of organizing the warp threads and attaching them to the loom. I'm making a heading band here on a band loom, which is basically some uprights and a shedding device. This shedding device is threaded with alternating red and yellow threads and alternating blue and black threads, so that in one shed, the red and blue threads come up, and in the other shed, the yellow and black threads come up, creating these bands of color. These long loops of weft will become the warp on the warp-weighted loom. Come around here. Here is a completed heading band showing the white warp threads hanging from it. Here's the heading band attached to the loom. Here are the warp threads hanging down, half of them in front of the shed rod and half behind it. The space between them is the first shed. The second shed is created when the heddle rod, which is attached to the rear warp threads by string heddles,
is pulled forward. And here is the second shed. All of this works, of course, only because of the loom weights, in this case non-traditional weights, which are attached to the ends of the warps and hold them under tension. An Etruscan pendant from the 8th century BCE shows a band loom alongside a warp-weighted loom. On the other side are women spinning. This Scandinavian-type warp-weighted loom is basically identical to the ancient Greek or Roman loom, except that the shed rod is very close to the ground and there are brackets to hold the heddle rod in its raised position. The weights are bags of sand rather than the clay or stone weights that would have been used in antiquity. Two tools are needed, a shuttle or stick to hold the weft and a beater. My friend and weaving colleague Deborah Holcomb passes the shuttle through the first shed. The heddle bar is pulled back and placed on its holders, creating the second shed. The weft is beaten into place. The woman in the vase painting uses a stick, but the effect is the same. The weaving continues with this rhythm. Pass the shuttle, change the shed, beat in the weft. Here the weft is only about 30 inches wide, so Deborah stands in one place. If she were weaving a cloth twice as wide, either she would walk back and forth as she takes the shuttle from one side of the warp to the other, or two weavers might work together. Since this cloth is made of wool, it will shrink when it is washed and brushed, a process called fulling becoming smoother and tighter than it looks as it is being woven. Fred, could you say something about the poet as weaver? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think I'll have to sit down for that one. Uh, poet as weaver. Well, the poet's song, the poet's poetry, as in Odyssey 8, is oime. And oime we define as the song, but it's really the web of song. So right there you see that weaving and the crafting of song are viewed as coextensive. In Odyssey 8, when the blind bard starts his song, he begins from the proemion, and then he goes from there. The proem is the beginning of the weave. It's like the headband. And if the heading band is executed just right, then the rest of the web will be executed to perfection. Well, so also with singing, so also with composition. If you say it right at the very beginning, in the proemion, then the rest of the oime will be a perfect song. So poetic composition can be conceptualized as weaving, yes. just as we saw before in Latin examples, that it can be conceptualized as spinning. Cicero uses the metaphor of weaving more generally to describe any kind of writing. You know, that makes me think of the word uh, contexto as used by Cicero, just as the blind bard works out of the beginning of the web. So also in contexto, which comes from the word texto, to weave, the idea is that you take up the weaving where you left it off the last time. And this is the word contexto that gives us the English borrowing context, because a context is the ability to take up where you left off. And what's behind that idea is the idea of continuity. Uh, if you have the continuity, if you have the right beginning, uh, and if you have a goal directedness, then you have that sense of completeness and that completeness is expressed and even imagined in terms that are appropriate to the weaver and how the weaver weaves her web or his web. So we have song as weaving and also writing as weaving. Yes. There's also the tradition of storytelling as a pastime for spinners and weavers. The poet Tibullus mentions a girl who spins while an elderly woman entertains her with stories. Weaving can also itself be a means of telling a story. Ovid tells of Philomela, whose tongue was cut out by her brother-in-law Tyrius, who had raped and then imprisoned her. Deprived of the ability to speak, she weaves her story into a robe and has it carried to her sister, who immediately understands. There are many ways to weave pictures or patterns into cloth. Among other techniques, the ancient Greeks and Romans used supplementary weft 
and tapestry. Here Deborah is inserting a blue supplementary weft under two warp threads and over the next two, picking the sheds with her fingers. After the supplementary weft is beaten in place, the normal weft row goes in. In the next row, the supplementary weft takes a different course, and thus the pattern is built. With tapestry technique, a weaver can create just about any kind of image. I'm making this tapestry on a small frame loom, but it could be done on a warp-weighted loom. Instead of beating down, as I'm be doing here, the weaver would just beat up. In tapestry, the weft completely covers the warp, and instead of a single weft thread going from one side of the warp to the other, colored weft threads are put in wherever the picture demands. Each thread goes back and forth to fill in its own colored area. These tapestry images by Louise Wheatley, a contemporary weaver who uses ancient techniques, show the fluidity and detail possible in pictures woven by hand. We can't forget Arachne, the ultimate weaver. Arachne, a mortal woman, challenged the goddess Athena, patron of crafts, to a weaving contest. Athena's weaving depicted her gift of the olive tree to Athens, but also showed the consequences suffered by mortals who dare to challenge the gods. Arachne weaves many scenes of mortals deceived by the gods. Athena, unable to find any flaw in Arachne's weaving, tears the cloth and attacks Arachne with the shuttle. Arachne attempts to commit suicide by hanging herself. Athena relents and allows Arachne to live, but transforms her into a spider. As I think back on it all, I think of, number one, the spinning of wool and making thread, and number two, the interaction between horizontal and vertical threading on the loom. The horizontal threading would be flexible, relaxed, and the vertical threading would be tense, stretched. Put these two together and the interaction creates the web, the fabric, the cloth. And when you think about it, this kind of interaction is also what creates the fabric of the song, of the poem. And if I may extend it further, it helps us understand the fabric of ancient Greek and Roman, and for that matter, human thinking. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Prudence, for undertaking this exploration with me. I hope that you, too, now have a clearer mental image of woolworking and of how this rich source of metaphor helped shape thought in Greek and Roman antiquity. Please look at the other sections of the DVD for bibliography, word lists, and the passages from Greek and Roman literature that we discussed. You may now notice threads of textile imagery in the language you encounter in daily life. You may even want to try your hand at spinning or weaving. If so, the how-to section of this DVD will help you to get started.